Fill your thirst beside the river Wash the journey from your hands Feel the comfort flow inside you Come this far, you understand Hello and welcome to Healing Outside the Box. This is our 37th show. I'm Tracy Crampton. I'm an energy practitioner. And I'm Rosemary Lachance. I'm an energy healer and spiritual advisor. And we've made it our mission to introduce people to alternative forms of healing for the mind, body, and soul. Uh, we provide ongoing shows which explore many forms of alternative healing, including naturopathy, acupuncture, yoga, therapeutic massage, hypnosis, shamanism, and more. We will be continuously inviting guests who are experts in these fields to share their valuable information with you. We will also give you, the audience, the opportunity to email your questions to us and have them answered on the show. This show is for all of you who are standing before the bridge and are curious or actively seeking other ways to feel healthy, balanced, and peaceful. Um, let me share with you a famous quote. If you keep doing what you are doing, you'll keep getting what you've got. Okay, right? right, Tracy, we know that. Okay, the title of our show tonight is Curing Cancel, Panel Series, Part 1. We have with us Dr. James Sensenig, a naturopathic physician, and Dr. David Katz, a medical doctor. Nice to, nice to see you tonight. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice, nice to be here. Too. And Tracy okay. can't reach, so we won't shoot. Okay. <laughs> right, Thank you, Tracy. Wave. Okay, um, and I'm going to read Dr. Sensenig's bio. Dr. James Sensenig has been practicing naturopathic medicine for nearly 30 years and is well known for helping thousands of people regain their health. Dr. Sensenig sees patients with complaints of all kinds and is particularly interested in the treatment of digestive diseases, headaches, and migraine, joint and muscle complaints, and chronic fatigue. He also sees children with health problems ranging from asthma and eczema to developmental delays and autism. Dr. Sensenig graduated from the National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon, where he later served as Dean of Education. He was the founding president of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, the chairman of its Government Affairs Committee for a decade, and the founding dean of the College of Naturopathic Medicine at the University of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Dr. Sensenig has consulted for a number of government agencies, insurance companies, colleges, and natural products companies. He is on the faculty of the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Tempe, Arizona, and the University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine. And now? And I shall read Dr. Katz's bio. Dr. Katz is an internationally renowned authority on nutrition, weight management, and the prevention of chronic disease and a nationally recognized leader in the integrative medicine and patient-centered care. He is a board-certified specialist in both internal medicine and preventative medicine and public health, and associate professor adjunct in the public health practice at Yale University School of Medicine. Dr. Katz is the director and founder of Yale, New Yale University's Prevention Research Center, director and founder of the Integrative Medicine Center at Griffin Hospital in Danbury, Connecticut, and founder and president of the nonprofit Turn the Tide Foundation. Dr. Katz has published well over 100 scientific papers, numerous textbook chapters, and 12 books to date, and has twice been recognized by the Consumers Research Council of America as one of America's top physicians in preventative medicine. In 2009, Dr. Katz was nominated for the position of U.S. Surgeon General by the American College of Physicians and the American College of Preventative Medicine, as well as several other national and international organizations. He and his wife, Catherine, have five children. And I think that alone is some of That's the truly <laughs> that's impressive the survival. <laughs> there you go. And all is said and done, survival is the most impressive thing. Right. Absolutely. Well, our show tonight is really the first of what we hope to be a few panel discussions on 
um, preventative medicine and most importantly um, curing cancer because we, we feel that there's all this talk for years and years about the cure for cancer, the race for cancer, hoping to um, you know, find the answers and still we're I think swimming around in this field of trying to find the solutions to helping people prevent and <coughs> heal themselves from cancer. We are, and uh, Jim, if, if I may jump in and then uh, turn things over to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the cure for cancer is both an elusive goal and probably an unrealistic one because, of course, there are many kinds of cancer. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate cure for all kinds of cancer is good health. Mm -hmm. yes. Robust good health is the, is the only real defense we have against all of the diseases we don't want to get. But that said, th there, there really is some very provocative work going on that does point in the direction of something, if not quite the same as the cure for cancer, close to it. Uh, Dean Ornish, whose name is familiar mm -hmm. to those who yes. work in integrative medicine, is a friend. And uh, of course, most people know Dr. Ornish for his work in heart disease, but his recent focus has been on prostate cancer. And he and colleagues published a paper not all that long ago that showed you can nurture nature. Now, we've all heard that there's nature and there's nurture. Mm -hmm. There are genes, and then there's how we're raised. Well, they did a study in men with prostate cancer, and they showed that taking really good care of yourself, a plant-based diet, meditation, stress control, building social relationships, adequate sleep, all the good stuff, uh, holistic health promotion, mm -hmm. It downregulated the genes that contribute to prostate cancer and upregulated the genes that help control prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So, is that a cure for cancer? No, but even the genes that make us vulnerable to they cancer have can, switches, be, right? can be can modified. Switch it on, switch How they, it off exactly. Based on your so, you know, we do have a lot of powerful stuff to help control our risk for cancer and our recovery from it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another way of saying the same thing that's been said in naturopathic medicine for a long time, which is um, the emphasis is on the patient and not on the disease. Mm -hmm. So when one is robustly healthy, to use Dr. Katz's words, um, one is less susceptible to, less vulnerable to Absolutely. the disease process, in mm -hmm. this case, the cancer. And um, all of the factors that were just mentioned obviously are important as well as good nutrition. I mean, we can talk about antioxidants and anthrocyanidins and it goes on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But all these things are affecting the individual in a way that is supporting and creating normal function and better health. I, I, I agree. I, and you know, it's interesting, the, um, the dawn of genomic medicine is one of the, the, the big preoccupations mm -hmm. these days. You explain that to the audience in case yeah. they don't know well, what that you means. Know, our genome is basically the, the recipe for creating genes, each individual yeah. person written okay. in our genes. And so genomic medicine is the idea that we can, we can map everybody's genome. Okay. I'll know, you know all of your genes, Rosemary, or all of my genes. And because we know our genes, we know our vulnerabilities, and, and we can provide better medicine. But you know, frankly, we know so much already, and I agree entirely with you. We know so much already about lifestyle and diet and, and factors that promote good overall health, and they really can change medical outcomes across the board. Cancer, mm -hmm. yes, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, on it goes. And I, you know, I think really what we're learning is that the genes themselves are responsive to these interventions that naturopathic medicine and, and really all practitioners who've been holistically inclined have long been focusing on. And we have a number of major publications showing how powerful lifestyle really is, what, mm -hmm. a, what a huge determinant of health outcomes it can be. Well, Trace, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Trace and I were were talking many times about this, and like you both had said, it's if they find a, a cure, a medicine, or something that will cure it, that's well and good. But without all the things that you just said, they still won't be cured because they that that's the lifestyle. Like you said, it's everything you said plus energy yeah. healing plus. Um, Psychotherapy plus, you know, finding out what, you know, the kind of cancer personality. Right. Okay. Well, <clears throat> if I may, just to pick up on that and what was just said, one of the ways to think about this, uh, Roger Williams introduced an idea back in the 60s or 70s called the genetotrophic theory of cancer, which was the, I guess, the predecessor to the yeah, current the genomics. Of its, and what genes, he said yeah. is just what was said is your genes confer certain. 
uh, biochemical requirements that are individual from person to person or different from person to person. And those genes are then expressed or they're not expressed depending on whether an individual's environmental needs, both external and internal environmental needs, are met. So for example, someone may have a certain gene for a disease like cancer, like diabetes. But what he says is really happening is what that gene is conferring is needs for certain nutritional factors, for example, mm -hmm. or certain detox pathways, which are different for me than they are for you. And so if my environment doesn't, if my environment's not optimal for me, I'm not gonna be optimally healthy. Mm -hmm. What's optimal for me, what's optimal for David, what's optimal for you, for Tracy, it's all different. Mm -hmm. And something, something obviously is going on. Back in 1971, when Richard Nixon declared war on cancer, about one in four people in the United States would have cancer in their lifetime. And now we're up to about 40 or 50 percent of the population will experience cancer. Obviously, something's changing, and I think most people would agree it's the environment or something in the environment, both, again, external and internal, mm -hmm. which is detracting from the robust, optimal health that we're talking about mm -hmm. here. And if I can just throw one other thing in there, this is a multifactorial problem. And that's why your statement is correct. There's just, there's no one cure, because there's not one cancer, right? There's many different factors involved, and the idea that we're looking for a single cure for a single disease is a little bit of a misnomer. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Dr. Katz? Well, you know, certainly we don't want to be dismissive about the potency of modern medical intervention. Right. You know, That's frankly, if, if we or someone we loved had cancer and needed surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, we really ought to have those things. The unfortunate thing is that the cancer developed in the first place. And there's still a need, of course, for holistic care of the patient. Because frankly, chemotherapy targets the tumor. That right. treats the disease. It, it, it certainly is not about the health of that person. And that's a time when it's critically important to provide integrative cancer care, where, where some of what you're doing is all about building up the health of the person, even as you're attacking the tumor. And frankly, that's really what you're doing, whether it's with surgical instruments to cut out a tumor or chemotherapy to try and kill the cells. And then, you know, back to this issue of genes, and because, you know, so much of what we know about the root causes of cancer relate to the behavior of, of genes, so it's an important topic. I agree with Jim, and of course, the, the kind of medicine we both practice is very individualized. We spend a lot of time with patients at the Integrative Medicine Center. We do uh, a model of care that really derives a, a great deal of, of uh, philosophical guidance from naturopathic medicine. I work collaboratively with naturopathic physicians. We see our patients together, put our heads together, mm -hmm. and, and that's how we practice that's integratively. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of time involved, and it's highly individualized. But I, I do like to remind people, because I, I think it's important for those watching, well, I guess I, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking some, someone might imagine what we're saying now. You know, we, we need to know our genes to decide what's best for us. Well, then I guess I don't know what a healthy diet is until someone tells <laughs> me what my genes are. Or maybe, maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't be physically active we until I know, know what's what, good what's for my right genes. What's the right recipe for me sure, without yeah, yeah, getting I'm sure that we genome. agree. You absolutely can fine tune the recipe for good health to each individual, but the basics of it pertain to all of us. Everybody should avoid tobacco. Everybody should get regular physical activity. Everybody should get enough sleep. Everybody should eat a healthful diet, mostly plants, not too much, weight control, and the list goes on from there. Mm -hmm. But it's not a terribly long list, and it, it really is universally relevant. And then comes the fine tuning. And I think you know there's a lot to be gained from the fine tuning. But you shouldn't give up, the, you know, the big picture while waiting. You know, don't give up the forest while waiting to learn about the individual trees. Let's put it that way. But if you are at that point of needing medical intervention, radiation, chemotherapy, um, surgery to remove a tumor, um, what? Where are we? Where are we in in medicine at this point? What What's promising? Well, a number of things are, frankly. First of all, uh, just, you know, we'll sort of cover the big picture. A lot mm -hmm. of what we'll be discussing, I think, will be about promoting good health and, and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. but, but there are several stages here. There is uh, creating health to prevent the development of cancer in the first place. Then there's cancer screening to detect it right. early. And, and folks, really important that, that 
screening get done. And we have screening tests that work very well that find cancer early. Finding it early is much better than finding it late. Everybody should get screening colonoscopy to look for colon cancer. Mm -hmm. It works. We can find precancerous polyps. We can remove them before ever they become a threat to life. Every, every woman should have mammograms. Uh, the, you know, the evidence that, that these are life-saving is quite convincing. Not so clear, by the way, that every man should be screened for prostate cancer. The evidence there is not nearly mm -hmm. as definitive. So you know, th there really ought to be dialogue with doctors about right, what, what screening tests for cancer work. And then, you know, frankly, it's shared responsibility. Uh, doctors can offer advice. Health practitioners can offer interventions and advice about health. Ultimately, the patient has a lot of control here, so screening is crucial. And then where are we with treatment? Getting better all the time. You know, we really are. Mm. New chemotherapy, uh, more targeted radiation therapy. None of it is stuff anybody wants. Nobody wants to have surgery to remove a tumor. Nobody wants radiation or chemotherapy. But the mortality rate, the death rate from cancer, across the board is coming down because of these therapies. Now, then I think we can, we can take it to a new level by providing holistic cancer care, where we use these modalities to treat the disease and other practices at the yes. same time to treat the patient. All right, you brought up chemotherapy and radiation, and that brings up a question that people have asked me many, many, many times. Um, this would be for Dr. Sensenig. Are there ways to treat without having chemotherapy and radiation? That's a Naturally, nat nature medicine, what you do. Yes, but I'm going to have to answer that in the most generic Okay. In the most generic way. If, <clears throat> if disease is a breakdown, any disease, in this case cancer, if disease is a breakdown in, again, we'll use the concept of this robust health, mm -hmm. or classically in the individual's defenses, mm -hmm. then theoretically there ought to be ways to reverse cancer by returning somebody to health. Right. Now there are theories, some unifying theories of cancer that are hundreds of years old that suggest that everybody's making malignant cells all the time, that it's a universal problem and that under, quote, normal circumstances, our defense mechanisms, our immune system, our overall health is such that the cells that are, in this case, cancer cells, are removed before they become much of a problem. That is, before they can multiply to the point where they're recognized as a tumor. And, you know, the evidence for that is that you can find some of these things early on, like the colon polyps, for mm -hmm. example. It's therefore a balance between the individual and the individual's resistance or the immune system and the disease process. Now theoretically, if you can restore that balance, then you could overcome the cancer. And I think there is some evidence for that. There's an article that was published in a journal whose name I can't think of off the top of my head just last year about a study that was done in Oslo, Norway, of 6,000 women with breast cancer. And in following these women without treatment, they found that 22% had spontaneous remissions. Then what the question is, is why, how, what's the spontaneous remission? What happened in that person's life that tipped the scale against the cancer? Mm -hmm. Now what we'd like to believe, theoretically, is that if we're restoring robust health, optimum function, that that can be done. My experience has been if that is done early on, that you can reverse the process. However, it depends on the stage of the cancer, it depends on what kind of cancer it is, and so on and so forth. Some cancers, so like as we point, all know, right? some cancers are more easily treated mm -hmm. than others. That's true with conventional oh, medicine as well as with non-conventional medicine. So you can't really say, is cancer reversible with natural treatments? It depends on the person, depends on the cancer, depends on the stage of the cancer, and so on and so forth. The emphasis in the, it, from a naturopathic point of view, the em there should be more emphasis on the patient and the health of the patient. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that's going on in integrated medical centers and in the broad public interest in, in better health and, and uh, factors that were just mentioned. So it's a really, it's a, it's a very, it's hard to sit here and say, yeah, you can cure cancer without using chemo and radiation. Um, then again, cancer, I mean, uh, chemo and radiation and surgery as was also mentioned just a moment ago, it, it, that's targeted to the tumor. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The tumor is the manifestation, you might say, of the imbalance, if we use these broad sweeping generalizations. That'd be a little like cutting off your arm when it's broken. You need to pay attention, or we think you need to pay attention, and I think Dr. Katz would agree, you need to pay attention to the overall health and the chemistry, the biochemistry, the physiology of the patient. You need to treat the tumor, and you need to treat the patient. Okay. Oh, I, I, I'd just like to comment on what a good and, and complete and responsible answer that was because, you know, in naturopathic medicine and in what I do in integrative medicine, we would both love to say what patients would love yeah. to hear. You don't you have to do have it, yeah. these, you know, <laughs> toxic and unpleasant treatments. But in fact, all too often you do. And, it, you know, in very early cancer where the cancer is indolent or slow going, where you really think you have time to produce great patient defenses, robust good health, and observe and, and maybe achieve what was achieved in, in this study of breast cancer where some of the cancers just went away on their own. Th there are some opportunities to do that, but by and large when patients come to us with cancer, it's a clinically manifest cancer. They're having symptoms, it came to detection, they're mm -hmm. aware of it. and. Frankly, you know, the, the horse is out of the barn, stage, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's too late to rely on that, that gradual, gentle process of restoring health and trying to contain this. So then you have to do both. You have to treat the disease. And I, I think it's, it's really important and um, critical orientation for patients to hear from a naturopathic physician, from an integrative medicine practitioner. We know you'd like to avoid these things, but don't. And, you know, we have a philosophy at, at my clinic, and we try to impart it to every patient. We don't always succeed. Uh, but again, there, you know, there's a very strong naturopathic influence in the clinic. Uh, we would all like to avoid drugs and, and uh, you know, the, the various, let's call them unpleasant aspects of modern medical intervention whenever possible. But we tell our patients, we don't really care, frankly, if a given treatment comes from a test tube or the leaf of a tree, you know, whether it's from science or nature. What we care about is, do you need it? Is it going to be effective? Is it part of a comprehensive strategy to help treat whatever the condition is and also to promote your health? Is it safe? Or is it at least the safest option that will get the job done? Do we have scientific evidence that allows us to determine whether or not it will contribute meaningfully to your recovery? Is there something else that would do the job better, yes or no? If yes, we should use that. But if no, this may not sound great. You know, surgery to remove a tumor doesn't mm -hmm. sound great, but if it's the best thing to increase the likelihood of survival and, and getting over the tumor, then obviously it has to be very seriously considered. In general, patients should be receptive. I think they should be working, ideally, with practitioners who are open-minded and, and holistic in their orientation. But then it, it takes two to tango, and, and patients should be receptive to, okay, you know, tell me based on your knowledge and training what you think I need, and I will be open-minded about that. And, you know, when a cancer is far along, I, I think, by and large, modern conventional therapy is a critical component of cancer care. Mm -hmm. It just shouldn't stop there, and, and often it does. You, go ahead. I'm well, get <clears throat> that raises another point that I'd like to make, which is, it's not either or. I would encourage anyone who is being treated for cancer or seeking treatment for cancer to explore all the options mm -hmm. and to have holistic, integrative, naturopathic care simultaneously. Some people think, well, if I'm yeah, going to have chemo or, or radiation, or they think in, we're in right, two different camps. they feel like they're in this yeah. camp. I've got mm -hmm. to choose between conventional care and then I've got to choose between these more unconventional or non-conventional treatment modalities. And the truth is you can do both and are probably well advised to do both because yes. the non-conventional, holistic, integrated, naturopathic, whichever term we're going to use here, is designed to help strengthen the patient and the patient's defense against the disease their surveillance against the disease. So that can be complementary to okay. conventional and care if that's what somebody is seeking. I, I agree completely. But that requires that patients find a practitioner who is 
open right. to both. both. Yes. Yeah, there's danger and in both they're directions. Open too. I mean, that's sometimes an issue that you you know have a patient come and they have their very their mind is set. On exactly. This is what will help me. Well, and, and, and practitioners play into that. You know, there's some patients who want conventional care and wouldn't think about alternatives. Mm -hmm. And then and more often, well. more often we see the opposite. You know, patients who I just want the natural care. And you know, frankly, we need practitioners who push and say, really, you want the best of both. Mm -hmm. uh, let's you know, let, let us bring to bear on your recovery everything we've got. And you know, Jim, it sounds like that's your orientation. It's certainly mine. And in our clinic, we we do that. And um, Tracy, forgive me. You mentioned that my clinic is uh, affiliated with Griffin Hospital in Danbury, Connecticut. It's actually Derby. Derby. Griffin's Sorry. in Derby. That's Apologies. all right. And uh, Griffin actually has uh, recently opened a. a, a magnificent comprehensive cancer treatment facility uh, designed in accord with the plain tree principles of patient-centered care, really a remarkable place. And actually our integrative medicine center is now housed there and predicated on, on this notion that we, you, know, you really want comprehensive mm -hmm. treatment. It should be about the patient, not just about the disease. And, and you know, frankly, modern medicine does err in that direction. But it would, it would also be a mistake to go seek out alternative practitioners who say, well, you, you never want to get conventional care because it's too toxic. Or, I, I think there's a lot of real power in modern medicine, and there are limitations. There's a lot of real power in complementary alternative medicine, uh, holistic care. But if it excludes modern conventional medicine, then there are real limitations there as well. Uh, I think patients get the best we've got to offer when they're open to that full spectrum of mm -hmm. treatments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's they simply, can. You know, it's, 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 it's a matter of having the right tool for the job. Right. And it depends on what the job is. Right. Right. That's why sometimes I this works, on the show sometimes before, this works. Like if right. you break a bone, you know, yeah, an herb won't fix it. But you, oh, you right. understand that everybody right. has their right. role and, and it's a team approach, and that's what we're hoping that we can convey that it is a team approach and, and these are all the professionals that are available to you for, you know at this stage at this stage at this stage or just surround yourself with them and, and you know I think it's only fair to know Tracy that because you know we're encouraging an array of treatments an array of practitioners that there are places you could go where the it's care you there. get would not Really, be reputable. I mean, there's some people right. who. I mean, even oh, yeah. in the modern age, there are, there are snake oil salesmen, mm -hmm. right? So, open-minded skepticism. Everybody should be from Missouri and you know, be a little <laughs> bit skeptical about everything, right? Whether it's modern medicine or alternative medicine or whatever, always be a little bit skeptical, but always be open-minded. Mm -hmm. And if you, you you cautiously explore all of your options, there's a very good chance you're going to wind up with good people and the best possible care that can be provided. Uh, you so. talked about chemotherapy and radiation. What other, what would you use as a naturopathic doctor for someone who can, supposing someone didn't want to do the conventional treatment, like what you just mentioned, and they came and said, what can you do to help me? That's one, part one of this question. I have a part okay. two. Well, in regard to part one, um, this may sound trite, but the emphasis again in naturopathic medicine is on the patient, not on the cancer. Right. So what we're looking at is not treating cancer, but helping the patient overcome the imbalance, which is the cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, there's almost overwhelming evidence for certain nutrients in the in in the treatment of cancer because of the way they help the immune system. So you're talking about various kinds of phytonutrients, particularly something called the oligoproanthrocyanidins. This is like red grape skin, yeah, we for have to example, explain it to and the so on. Our, our but also antioxidants, antioxidants, antioxidants. We're right. hearing a lot about anti antioxidants. Antioxidants are a class of um, biologicals that reduce damage to the cells, the simplest way to put mm -hmm. that. And they right. range from the simple uh, to simple vitamins and minerals like vitamin C and zinc and selenium to more complicated phytonutrients. There's also some interesting um, historical information that has to do with enzymes and enzyme therapy in cancer. And this arises from a theory that cancer cells act like certain other cells in the body that are 
vulnerable to the digestive enzymes. And without going into too much detail, certain enzymes from the pancreas are known to not just break down our food, but also break down cells that are dead or dying or sick or injured or malignant. So high doses of certain kinds of enzymes can also be helpful. Mm -hmm. Detoxification is extremely important. Yeah for a whole lot of reasons, not the least of which we are living in a more and more toxic environment. People are consuming more toxins in the air, the water, and so on, and they're not eliminating as well, and that's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. So those things put together in a very simple way. We're talking about nutritional uh, intervention, changes in diet, we're talking about megavitamin therapy sometimes, we're talking about detoxification, we're talking about enzymes, and then there's a whole other area that has to do with herbal medicine and homeopathic right. medicines mm -hmm. that will also go to the point of treating, or are designed, you might say, to restore balance in the individual. I know that's a very bizarre generalized term, but homeopathic medicines and some herbal medicines affect people on levels beyond the physical. You know, they help us with our emotional state and our psychological state, and that's important mm -hmm. as well for the reasons that were, that were already mentioned. I think it's probably fair to say that there are people, depending again on the person, on the type of cancer, on the stage of the cancer, if it's early enough, that process is enough to reverse the cancer or the growth of the cancer. But I can give you examples where people have sought this out, and we've all just kind of alluded to this. I have had patients who did not want to have conventional therapy. And depending on the situation, and my experience, and my knowledge, I might agree to see somebody under those circumstances carefully following the tumor, right? If we have evidence that it's growing through MRIs, CAT scans, cancer markers, Mm -hmm. Cancer markers are individual blood tests that tell us whether there's an increase or a decrease in the tumor. If the intervention, the conservative naturopathic intervention, is not making a positive impact, then obviously that person needs to seek conventional care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there, that brings us around to, is there a cancer personality? Mm -hmm. You could share. Well, Both of you can answer that one. Take your turn. Well, I'm no expert on that, but there's been a lot written on that. Uh, right here in our own backyard, Dr. Bernie Siegel has written about that mm -hmm. and, and talked about that. And before him, a fellow by the name of Lawrence Lachan wrote extensively about the cancer personality back in the 60s and the 70s. And then before that, there was an oncologist in Texas, uh, Carl Symington, and his wife, uh, Stephanie Symington, who was a psychologist, where the husband oncologist medical doctor was noticing that cancer patients seemed to fit in a certain psychological box or a certain style and his wife the psychologist Stephanie I think it was Stephanie Symington uh, began researching that and ended up agreeing that there was a certain kind of personality that tended uh, that's not a cause and effect relationship but there were certain personality traits or certain psychological factors that seem to be more common in people with cancer than in people who didn't have cancer. Do you agree uh, with that, Dr. Katz? Actually, I don't. Um, I, for, I, and although I, I don't disagree with what Jim just said because uh, he stated it in a very balanced way, we don't have a cause and effect relationship established. Uh, for one thing, when you find an association, when A and B travel together, is A causing B or is B causing A? So you know it may be that there's a common human reaction mm -hmm. to the experience of cancer, and there are common personality traits that develop because of the cancer but didn't lead to it. But my, my single most fundamental objection to the notion of a cancer personality is that children sometimes get cancer. I, you know, I also object to the notion that willpower is the root cause of epidemic obesity because we have epidemic obesity in children. I mean, we can talk about you know, how adults are different, and, mm -hmm. but you know, frankly, kids are kids. Today's kids are just like kids from a generation ago, and uh, you know, I, I don't think there is a unique personality in childhood that leads to cancer. I, I think there's a strong genetic predisposition to certain childhood cancers. So kids, in some ways, can be the exception that proves the rule, that there's vulnerability to cancer that transcends personality now. Uh, another uh, local expert, Lisa Berkman, who was at Yale for many years and is now at Harvard, has published extensively on how personality 
traits can influence the course of a disease. Optimists right. tend to do much better when recovering from cancer or mm -hmm. heart disease than pessimists. Being down, being defeatist, being gloomy is not good for health. Feeling like you can do this. There's no question that one of the repositories of our health is our psyche, our, our psychology, our attitude. And if your attitude is weighing you down, it will be an impediment to good health. If, if your attitude is a balloon that lifts you up, you know, then it, it isn't going to make you healthy all by itself, but it's sure going to help you along. So do I think there is a relationship between personality and vulnerability to cancer and cancer recovery? I do. Do I think there's a cancer personality per se? You know, certain traits that mm -hmm. if you have those traits, you're going to get cancer? I really don't. Well, Tracy and I as energy healers, okay, we've noticed that um, when pe we've had treated people with that kind of a disease, we notice a lot of anger in the personality or a lot, you know, harboring uh, guilt from the past. You know, those kind of negative emotions in a person. That's what I meant. You know, this is what we've noticed and they have this kind of a disease because it, it's almost like it, you know how that eats you up inside? Sure. And then you take the analogy of cancer eating you up inside, you know, well, so. Yeah, and, and you know, that may very well be true. Mm -hmm. I, I think some people are angry because they get cancer. So finding mm -hmm. anger or, or disappointment or bitterness, I, I think, uh, you know, that, that it's, if I were to get cancer, someone I love yeah. were to get cancer, I, you know, and you I'd be careful not to say, you know, this is by any means, don't blame yourself because, you right. know, this, that's what we're trying to do. Gonna, this just, this, just this say, is what well, I want to stress to the audience, right. it's, too. Yeah. It's not about blame, right? right. It's exactly. just about, yeah. you know, introspection, too, and seeing where, where your psyche is and, and how are you um, managing that so that you can. I, stay I, balanced and right. in best health, considering all the toxins were bombarded with. Right. And, and I, you know, I think we have fundamental agreement. But I can't help but point out, I, I am a trained research scientist. My, my day job, I, I take care of patients, but the bulk of my time is spent doing research. And we know that there are certain vulnerabilities of different research methods. And in a kind of study called the case control study, where you might say, I will have 10 people who have a kind of cancer and 10 people, same sex, same age, who don't have the cancer. And we'll see if we can figure out what's different between them so mm. that this group got cancer and this group didn't. Well, there is a profound distortion in the results due to something called recall bias. Recall bias is remembering the past differently because of your current health. Oh, interesting. If you have yeah. cancer, you know, and you're asked, you know, did you have guilt, did you have stress, you, you, everything is going, yes, I did, because yes, you're, you're desperately an seeking an yeah. explanation for your disease. If you're healthy, and you're asked, you know, has guilt been a big issue in your life, you shrug your shoulders and say, no, I don't really think so. But if the healthy people had the cancer, they would answer the questions differently because the disease changes their, their orientation. So this is a very common problem in research methods. And so I, I'm not no, disagreeing I with you. I, I think know, personality and, and is And it important. could be some of what we see, too, when people come to us because yeah, they're, be they're yeah. saying but that, you know, yeah, maybe that, this is to blame it. or maybe that is to blame. Because people want to know why. You know, if something bad happens, mm -hmm. it's just human nature. You want to know why did this happen to me? And you seek answers. And when you ask questions, could this be a factor? Yeah, it could. And you're going to get a lot of positives. Doesn't mean it isn't true, and it, it's, it mm -hmm. certainly doesn't mean that the care you provide is not targeting important areas. It probably is. Um, but I'd be very careful about in, you know, interpreting that in a cause mm -hmm. and effect way. In a broad mm -hmm. way. Right. Well, what we do is try to find the problem and talk them and out of that. And, yeah, it. yeah, right, right. alleviate the problem for them and not, you know, get rid of the guilt and everything, sure. you know. Which so. is a good thing anyway, wh whether that right. contributed to the development of the cancer or not. It's a good thing, and and you know again, certainly establishing emotional health, we all agree, mm -hmm. is part of health. And and you know again, treating cancer, treating any disease, you really want to treat the patient. And and what you're after here is not just make the disease go away, but make health come into the picture. And that's emotional health as well as physical health. Perhaps we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, why cancer is becoming so prevalent. Mm. What is your take on, you know, what are some of what are some of the triggers that are flipping that switch, that genetic predisposition on, you know, so for so many right now? Well, you know, a few brief remarks on the epidemiology and uh, Jim, I'll pass the baton to you. I'm I'm not as concerned with trends actually as as it sounded like Jim may be 
from his earlier comments. We've been tracking cancer rates. Uh, there are a number of major epidemiology programs at the Centers for Disease Control, for example, that look at cancer trends in this country. One of the reasons we have more cancer is because fewer people are dying of heart disease, <laughs> and lifespan is gradually increasing. Now, unfortunately, we're not having healthy years of life. We're having more and more chronic disease, and one of those chronic diseases is cancer. But actually, cancer mortality rates in most areas are coming down, and the rate at which cancer is occurring has gone up and stabilized, and it's actually gone down for the past several years. How about childhood cancer? Has that changed? Uh, I mean, if we're thinking about lifespan and more people are getting... I don't think we've seen major changes except for dramatic improvements in, in survival rates because childhood lymphomas and leukemias are overwhelmingly treatable now. So there are still, unfortunately, some forms of childhood cancer that don't have cures but more and more of them do. So mortality rates of childhood cancer have come down dramatically over recent decades. The rate of childhood cancer has not changed appreciably. In terms of you know, the, the, the burden of cancer in society at large, the, the leading killer of adults in the United States of America is heart disease, men and women alike. Mm -hmm. But the gap between heart disease and cancer has narrowed, partly because we're bringing down the death rate from heart disease, partly because as people live uh, a longer span, eventually cancer becomes uh, a vulnerability we all face. Eighty percent of men who live to the age of 80 or beyond have prostate cancer, 80 percent. Now most of them die with it but not of it, meaning okay, it you know, yeah. doesn't right. necessarily yeah, cause them any un grief. It's just, it's just there. Find it, yeah. all right, but it says something about the fact that, that age itself is a vulnerability factor to cancer. So you know the, the trends are not all that ominous, but I think here's a critical consideration. Most epidemiologic experts who study cancer, so you know, most people who look at the health of the population agree, uh, including John Seffrin, who's president of the American Cancer Society, and we, uh, we were on a panel together not all that long ago, and, and we're discussing this very issue. Most experts agree that were we to apply what we already know about a very short list of behaviors, tobacco, diet, physical activity, weight control, we could reduce the current cancer burden in the population by somewhere between 30 and 60 percent. That's huge. So, you know, again, the trends are not all that ominous, really. A lot of it has to do with the aging of the population, but we shouldn't be complacent because there's vastly more cancer than there needs to be, and, yes. and that's a critical issue. So you're saying, like, we, the environment has nothing to do with it, or what's in the food the that we eat today? I think it has a or lot. Are you of seeing any commonalities with, with the people that you treat for, you know, at your, at your clinic. You know, I think the environment has a lot to do with it. We know there are many carcinogens that we're exposed to and potential carcinogens. But the, you know, for example, people worry about pesticide residue mm -hmm. and food and, and so forth. Um, all legitimate concerns, probably a, a, a real contributor. But extremely hard, if not impossible, to trace the, the isolated contribution that exposure makes to the development of a cancer of an, in an individual. And just imagine, you know, we have, a, we have a population in this country of 300 million people. Imagine if a given chemical in the environment increased the occurrence of cancer over the course of a lifetime by one person in a thousand, okay, over a lifetime. That's a lot. That's huge. But to do a study that shows that, you need a thousand people in the exposed group and a thousand people in the control group to see one cancer more in the, in the exposed group. To see 10 cancers more, you'd need 10,000 people in both groups. And to see 100 cancers more, you need 100,000 people, and you have to follow them for a lifetime. So some of what's true is it's exceedingly hard, to, hard to pin down with science. So you know, as a scientist, as someone who does studies, I can point out how we should use science and, and be respectful of it. I'm also very willing to admit there are limitations, and sometimes you know, we have to look carefully at what we think is going on, even if we don't have definitive scientific evidence. The answer is nobody knows for sure. What is the net contribution of contaminants in our food to cancer? Nobody knows for sure. Is it theoretically reasonable to think that those chemicals aren't doing us any good? Absolutely. What do you have to say in that? Same well, question. I think my answer is going to sound more like a clinician looking at trends than as a researcher, but some of the same things. Mm -hmm. the, um, from you know, the naturopathic view of the world, our environment is more toxic than it has ever been, and we can talk about that all night. Toxins in the food, in the air, in the water, and so on. 
a, a group called the Environmental Working Group recently did a study, recently, within the last five years or so, where they looked at umbilical cord blood from 10 newborns chosen at random from around the United States. And I, they were looking for, I believe it was 267 different chemicals, 230 some of which are known carcinogens. Mm -hmm. And they were found in the umbilical cord blood. So we're talking at birth, right? So if those carcinogens were in the infant at birth, obviously they were in mom. Right. And if they were in mom, they're probably in the rest of mom's environment and her parents and so on and so forth. I mean, no one knows for sure. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that the burden of toxins that we're all exposed to is continuing to increase. Yeah. I would have to agree, it'd be impossible to figure out how any one of those might be contributing. But in sort of classical naturopathic thinking, it's this over overwhelming it's burden, burden. Mm -hmm. right. that may be affecting our overall health. Mm -hmm. And then you add to that the other side of it. We talk about robust good health. In this country especially, but also throughout the rest of the world, the quality of our food is rapidly decreasing, particularly with respect to minerals in the food. Yeah. We have farmed the minerals out of the soil, and if minerals aren't in the soil, they don't find their way through the land-based food chain. So, for example, when I was in school way back in the last century, and we were doing testing for minerals, we would often find calcium to be deficient, probably more often than anything else. Well, that was 30-some years ago. Now everybody knows about calcium. But there's other minerals. There's 109 other minerals on the periodic table, all of which are necessary for life, that aren't in our food or not in adequate amounts. So people are coming up deficient in selenium and zinc and other mm -hmm. minerals. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is the quality of the nutrition. We talked about nutrition and the internal environment switching genes off or switching genes on or allowing for expression or not. Mm -hmm. To some extent, we don't have the high, we don't have the quality nutrients that we need to do that, particularly if somebody is eating what a lot of Americans mm -hmm. eat. Glow Fast in the dark food. The I mean, dark food. Yeah. I, mean I, yeah. have, I have, a, I have <laughs> to just comment, I, have a, I saw a patient recently who, who admits that she doesn't cook mm -hmm. and the family is fed on fast food. Oh. Now, we're not talking about the occasional fast food. We're talking about living on fast food. I can't imagine that the adequate nutrients are available there. So I think one of the things we see in naturopathic medicine, or we argue about, is that you have this growing discrepancy between the quality of the internal environment because of devitalized food, processed food, mm -hmm. and so on, and then you have the increasing stress on the system at the same time. And as those two things are moving away from each other, we're more we're less healthy and we're more vulnerable. A, a very logical perspective and, and thinking that way and, and combining, the, uh, taking care of patients, I do have a clinician's perspective too and we're all very much influenced by what we see in our patients. We need to be respectful uh, about science, responsible in our use of science, but responsive to the needs of patients that go on all too often when the science is running thin and then there's a need for judgment. The, the clinician's insight, the clinician's compassion, and the clinician's judgment to make assessments about the way the world is. And, you know, whether it's chemical exposures in our food or people eating the wrong kinds of food or the combination of both, clearly there are many choices associated with modern living that we make individually and that we've made collectively that take us away from health. Mm -hmm. And it's part of our mission to try and re remove those barriers right. well, and create every opportunity for people in health to get back together. And, uh, you know, there, there have been studies showing, uh, I've read two in the last two years, suggesting that on average organically grown produce in small farms is 15 to 20 percent more concentrated in vitamins and minerals than produce produced on these large industrial non-organic farms. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the notion that even when you choose the right foods, the right stuff isn't necessarily in the right, right. foods because they weren't grown the right way. Demineralized soil. Yes. Clearly that's got to matter. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another way, to, to, I think, to say what you just said in, the, in a more vernacular way, which is that you said we're making these collective choices, these social, societal choices that are perhaps harming us. To be healthy today, I believe, you have, you're swimming upstream. You mm -hmm. are. You're making choices that are going against the grain in the sense that they are the opposite of what society at large is doing. 
to be healthy. We have created an environment which is not supporting us in reaching our physically optimal health. So, so to do that, you have to make choices that are different than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have this show, Healing Us. That's <laughs> right, with sense, exactly. And, and, and you know, when, when you were reading my bio, one of the things that came up that, and nobody listening knew what it meant was public health practice. I agree completely with Jim. Um, and uh, mostly what I focus on in, in my research is nutrition and, one, and uh, physical activity as well. One of the comments uh, that I make routinely is that throughout most of human history, we lived in a world where calories were scarce and hard to get and mm -hmm. physical activity was unavoidable. We have devised a modern world where physical activity is scarce and hard to get and calories are unavoidable and, and mm -hmm. packaged yeah, in all the wrong know. ways. Yeah, so way absolutely, we are swimming upstream and to be fair to, to viewers, uh, it's too much to ask for every individual to swim against the current. Yeah, you've got to try. It's your health. It's the health of your family, your kids. You've got to do what you can do. But we have to collectively do what's necessary with policies, with programs. We need physical activity in schools. We need healthy nutrition in schools. We need worksite programs that make physical activity every day the norm. We need a society where it's normal to take the stairs rather than the elevator to go up one flight. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've probably all seen cartoons along these lines, but I, there's a cartoon I know, a group of women standing waiting for an elevator and there's a sign that says aerobics class second floor. Mm -hmm. But at the bottom of the stairs waiting for the elevator to get up to the aerobics. I mean, we just, we think about physical activity. It's, it's, it's wrong. You know, it's not a burden. It's something we should all relish. We have this natural animal vitality, these muscles that we could use and most of us choose not to. So we need, we need cultural change and we need a lot of policy change so that, frankly, health becomes the path of least resistance. We, we need the will to pursue health mm -hmm. and that will come from us individually. We need ways to pursue health and that's got to come from the body politic, frankly. And I've mentioned on this show too before about you know, we, we, we look at nutrition and we look at physical exercise and basically I think the same thing's happening internally as we're getting lazy because we eat this processed food which without all of these things are that for our body to work on breaking down, it's like internally those muscles are degrading, those muscles are getting lazy. So I have to I have to share a story with you that's anecdotal, of course, but goes right to the heart of this. First mm -hmm. of all, let me mention that the World Health Organization now ranks the United States 92nd, that's 9-2, in overall healthfulness mm -hmm. out of 191 nations, and number <laughs> one is France. I had a patient a few years ago whose major complaint was hypothyroidism, low thyroid function, and high cholesterol. And she's lived most of her adult life in the United States. She was invited by a family member to come home to Ireland for a few weeks for a vacation. Mm -hmm. And then she and this family member were going to go to France for a couple of weeks. Do I need to take my supplements? Do I need to watch my diet? I'd like to be able to enjoy myself in Europe. So I said, forget the supplements. Have a great time. But you don't understand. I'm Irish. If I go home to Ireland, I'm going to be drinking. Go home to Ireland, have a great time. Go to France, have a great time. When you get back home, I want you to go right to the lab and check your lipids, your cholesterol, and so on, right? Four weeks in Europe, drinking, eating bread, eating French fries, whatever else they're doing in France. <laughs> Her lipids were lower when she came back mm -hmm. than at any time before that. However, she was relaxed. She mm -hmm. was enjoying herself mm -hmm. around, and walking and exercise. Mm -hmm. She said she'd never walked so far in her life. They had a hotel where they had to walk to the Eiffel Tower. They didn't take a cab. No, um, no elevators walking up and down the stairs. Even in some of the best hotels, she told me she's dragging her suitcase up and down the stairs and so on and so forth. <laughs> she lost weight. Her thyroid problem was turned around and her lipids were turned around. And this mm -hmm. goes to the sort of public policy. You know, mm -hmm. we drive right to the store, we take the elevator to the gym mm -hmm. or the aerobics class and so on and so forth. And we don't relax. Like and you we said, don't we, don't, we don't feel that joy that we have when we're on vacation. So I guess another reason for sharing the story is the obvious. And then, you know, this underscores the idea that it doesn't take a pill for everything. 
You know, we don't need mm -hmm. medication right. for everything. We can make some of the kinds of changes in lifestyle that we're talking mm -hmm. about here. They have profound effects on our health. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They're just, they're harder to do. And, you know, a lot, a lot of times it's the patient who would rather take out. the pill because it's easy. Exactly. Well, and, and again, We've talked about that. You know, health care providers are only as good as the patients. It's a yes. relationship. I it's like a marriage. Right? Yes. I mean, what we get done, we get done. How much responsibility together. is the patient willing to? Yeah. Exactly. And so when you're both really committed, boy, you can move mountains. Mm -hmm. You can yes. absolutely move mountains. And all too often, we wind up using a pill to treat something that could be treated much more effectively, much more fun fundamentally with lifestyle, but lifestyle is a real commitment. Now, it also pays a much bigger dividend because it is, you know, when, when we talk about uh, medication for treating a disease or uh, trying to prevent progression of a disease, it's very targeted. Whereas a healthy lifestyle, we've been talking mm -hmm. about cancer, yeah, but the, the same things that will dramatically reduce your vulnerability to cancer will reduce your vulnerability to heart disease, diabetes, stroke, dementia, arthritis, and on and on it goes. Because robust good health is a defense against everything. The other thing is if you take a pill to target a risk factor or treat a disease, you're not going to share it with family members. Certainly shouldn't. But a healthy lifestyle, you can pay it forward. Mm -hmm. As a parent, there's, there's no better thing you could do mm -hmm. than for that to be the model that, that your kids grow up learning. So it, it's it's so much more powerful mm. than what we can do with medicine, which is narrowly targeted. But alas, you know, all too often we're, we're compelled to use medication to treat stuff that just isn't being addressed in those fundamental ways. And partly that's because it is too much work. It is against the stream. Very good. And we, we need to fix that. And we can, but we've got a long way to go. Very good. We're getting very close to the end. I can't believe how fast this went. And there's so much more we want to talk about. So we hope that we'll have you both back again. We really would love that. Mm -hmm. We want to discuss that. all kinds pleasure. of ways to help the people and give them all the ideas about everything. So we would love to have you come back again. Uh, we've got about a minute. So if there's any last thing you want to say to the uh, our audience, um, yeah, I don't Close think you can say thoughts. in a minute, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I, can, I can. I mean, in naturopathic care, I think you should see Dr. Sensen. There Sensenet. you go. That was nice. <laughs> and, um, and we're not too bad either at the Integrative Medicine Center. Uh, Rosemary and I can help Derby. you with this. Yes. Absolutely. There's, that's what I say. There's so many parts to it. That's why mm -hmm. these... There's going to be a lot of shows. Hopefully, in the future, we're going to have a lot of shows on this on and all I'll different say, ways. I'll Go say ahead, something say in less than 30 seconds. Go ahead. Exactly what was just said in a different way. In naturopathic medicine, we're fond of saying, if you're healthy, you're not sick, by definition. There right? you go. So the goal Excellent. is this health. robust, good health that health. we're talking about. Health. All right. Well, thank you both so, so much. Jim, pleasure so being So interesting. Thank so you, interesting. gentlemen. Thank you. Um, we're going to put up some of your information here so people know how to contact you. Okay, this is Dr. James Sensenig. He's a naturopathic physician. You can reach him at 203-230-2200 or on his website, www.naturalhealthconnecticut.com. And if you'd like to reach Dr. Katz, you can reach him at 203-732-1265. And he also has a website, www.davidkatzmd.com. And, we're and put our to, information. to reach us, you can email your questions to heal outside the box at yahoo.com. And for show schedules, visit either my website, www.rosemarylachance.com, or www.entirebeing.com, which is Tracy's website. To contact us, you can call me at 203 627 7966 or Tracy at 203 232 3405. If you would like to write a letter to us, you can write us at East West Healing Arts Building, 410 State Street, Suite Number 2, North Haven, Connecticut 06473. And if you'd like a copy of any of our shows, please visit one of our websites for more information and details. Okay? I'm going to leave you with our quote, as we always do. Yes, and the quote tonight is... Was it this one, right? Okay, go for it. No matter how much the ignorant will complain and disagree, life is a succession of perfect moments. We thank you for joining us. Thank you so much thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Tracy? Thanks. <laughs> It was a wonderful you. show, wonderful to have you here. Nice Pleasure. to hear. Thank you.
as you look out through the window to the world you have made always know you are the vision 